Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody today. I'm glad to be back with you again and uh, having a good time going through the book of 1 Peter. And today we are going to uh, be in chapter 3. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 13 through 17. And word on the street is there is a meal after service today. I mean, look at me. Does it look like I'm going to take too long to get to the buffet line? I don't think so. Uh, don't amen that, okay? That's, uh, no, but we'll, we'll do our best to make it through this today, and we'll get in there and uh, enjoy fellowshipping today. That'll be a good time. Um, so we have been going through the book of First Peter for the last 10 weeks. Uh, we have a few more weeks left. We're just kind of going verse by verse, just kind of soaking in what Peter has to say to us. And he has a lot to say about hope, about suffering, and about persevering and how we can do that through the living hope that we just sang about through Jesus. And so we are looking today at a very familiar passage of Scripture. I'm sure that you will, you will know it when we see it and when we read it here in just a second. But if you uh, would just look with me at verses 13 through 17. And here's what Peter says. He says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous... For what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you again for the opportunity to study in your word today, God. Uh, we get to see you in this word. It's not just ink on paper, not just words that we ramble through, but this is your word, the living word. We get the clearest picture that we can of you in your word, this side of heaven. And so, God, I just pray that you would help us today to soak in what it is that you want to teach us about uh, your word and about putting you on display, Jesus, about putting you uh, at the forefront of our lives so that people see you in us. And so, God, I just pray today that you would encourage us. God, I know it's been a difficult morning for many, um, but that just means that uh, we're going we're to see a blessing today, God. So I just pray that you would help us to, to see that, help us to just worship you. And God, for those who might be watching, might be listening, uh, might be visiting with us today that don't know you, God, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. I pray that they would see the hope that you give them, Jesus. And I pray, God, that you would change their life. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray all of these things. Amen. Amen. So growing up in southern Kentucky, um, I have seen many a barn that has a very famous slogan painted on either the side of the barn, most likely on the roof. Three words, Sea Rock City. I heard somebody say rock. <laughs> Middle section's got it going on, okay? So, so Sea Rock City. Anybody ever seen Rock City? Well, a few people. I haven't ever seen Rock City, uh, but the message implores me to go see Rock City city. It's, uh, of course, Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the story goes that you can see seven states from, uh, the, the, from the pinnacle there at Lookout Mountain. And uh, I was just thinking, uh, because today we're talking about being on display, this idea of being a billboard, right? And I got to thinking about this famous advertising campaign that we all know as Sea Rock City. It's kind of a piece of Americana now. And uh, it's because a man by the name of Garnett Carter and his wife Frida, they bought this piece of land on Lookout Mountain there in Chattanooga, Chattanooga Tennessee back in the 20s. And they started uh, converting it into this little neighborhood that they were going to call Fairyland. And that was because Frida had a deep uh, love for like the the European medieval tales about fairies and, and whatnot and so Garnet bought this piece of land for his wife and then they quickly realized that this was like a really special location they could make a an attraction 
out of this. So in 1935, they hired a man by the name of Clark Byers. And Clark was, was commissioned to go out. And he, what, what he would do is he would say, hey, look, my employer will paint your barn for free if we can just paint Sea Rock City on the roof so that people can see that billboard. And of course, any farmer, if you've ever tried to paint a barn, I've watched my grandfather do that, it is like really dangerous work. It's not easy. And I could only imagine, you know, back in the day, back in the 30s, trying to like haul all your stuff up on the barn and paint it. And so, so this was a very strategic marketing campaign. And so Clark Byers painted over 900 barns with the famous slogan, Sea Rock City, between 1935 and 1969. 900 barns, that's amazing, across 19 states. And that famous billboard, most everybody knows, Sea Rock City. You can actually buy birdhouses at their gift shop that says Sea Rock City. And I got to thinking about that. Like, that's, that's a message that they wanted out there, and they did their best to get out there. And some people have listened to that message. Some people have went and seen Rock City. Other people, like myself, have not, even though I've lived not far from Chattanooga for a time, I could have went and done that. But my whole point is to think about this as it was on display for people to see. They were getting the message out. And so the question I want to ask today is how do we, as followers of Jesus, put the hope of Jesus on display in our lives? First thing that I think that we can see here in the passage is we can do good. Look at verses 13 through 14. Peter has already highlighted the power of doing good works. He has talked about that a lot in this short epistle already. Remember back to week six of our study when we examined verse 12 in chapter 2. Peter there, he said, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And we learned from this verse that living an honorable, beautiful life marked by good deeds has the power to win over non-believers, those who are in the world who don't know Jesus, who are watching us. We learned that doing good works can win them over. In the past two weeks, Pastor Ken has been teaching us from chapter 3, the first part, and remember verse 1, he talked about wives be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So in other words, the good deeds of a believing wife before her unbelieving husband could win him over to Christ. So it's all about conduct. It's how you are living out your faith in Jesus where he has placed you. So Peter has been describing the lifestyle of the Christian. And doing good works is a base model feature for every Christian. We bought a car, a 2017 Mitsubishi Eclipse, not long after you know, they first hit the market. And I thought, man, this is the closest thing. We bought it used, but it only had like a couple hundred miles on it. I was like, this is the closest thing that we've got to a brand new car that I'm ever going to be able to buy in my life. And driving it home, could not find cruise control anywhere on that car. I'm like, where's the cruise control? And I get out the owner's manual when I get home. Guess what? Didn't have it. I thought, man, isn't cruise control like a base model feature on every car now? No. You had to flintstone that thing, man. You just, just got to keep on going using your feet. So doing good works is a base model feature for every Christian. Now, let's, listen, your witness and testimony for Jesus includes more than doing good works, but it definitely includes doing good works, blessing others, living out your faith in Jesus. And so in verse 13, Peter is highlighting this once again. He says, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? This word zealous here can also be translated as eager, like you're just kind of chomping at the bit. You're, you're ready every day to do good, to bless others others. And the idea here is not that you are a zealot on a mission to be on the right side of every debate in your society. Uh, that's not what Peter means when he calls on us to be zealous for what is good. He's not talking about winning every argument. The idea is that you are passionate 
for doing that which is good, not so that you will be puffed up with pride, but so that Jesus will be magnified. So you are eager to do good works, not so that you will be recognized, but so the Father will be recognized and Jesus will be made known. So listen, friends, it's just like I said a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago when we were studying chapter 2. A beautiful life lived for Christ that declares the beautiful gospel of Christ can lead others to know Him and bring glory to God. So we are literally putting our money where our mouth is. We're walking the talk, so to speak. So we should make it our mission each day to live a beautiful life marked by good deeds so that people will see Jesus in us. And we do this even when it's hard, even when we're being hassled, even when things come against us, even when you wake up and everything is difficult on that day, it doesn't change. Our circumstances do not de- negate or diminish our calling, ever. Resistance and persecution do not change our mission. We are to be fulfilling it anyway. So notice how Peter phrases verse 13. He says, he, he phrases it as a question. He says, now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good, right? It's a very similar way that Paul phrased Romans 8.31. You might be familiar with that verse. If God is for us, who can be against us? And you might be thinking, a lot of people can be against us. Everybody can be against us. Some days it feels like the whole world is against us. And that is true. Obviously, people can be against you. And maybe even harm you as you seek to follow Jesus and do good works and make Him known in this world. And many of the first century Christians that Peter and Paul wrote to did in fact face great persecution, great harm, great opposition. So this question, what Peter is saying here and what Paul says in Romans 8.31, they they are to be considered in the ultimate and eternal sense. Does that make sense? Not, I mean, obviously people can harm us, people can come against us, But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter this side of heaven because Jesus is still in control. So we should consider it in the eternal sense. Let's remember the immediate context here. Ken preached over it last week. What immediately came before in verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Peter quoting the Old Testament there. Friends, listen. God sees you and the good works you do for His glory. He sees that, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. That means he also sees any and every evil that you may encounter for living your life for him. He sees that. He's not just up there ignoring you. So every harsh word you endure for the gospel, every good work that is mocked, every criticism of your faith, every physical or verbal abuse that you may face for living a life that magnifies Jesus, God in heaven sees all of that. And because he sees it all, we can take heart that ultimately he will have the final say. He's not leaving us to fend for it on our own. He sees it. And sometimes we don't understand why things happen in this life, and and we might not understand that until we get to heaven, but I think that when we get there, we'll see how God weaved all of it together in a beautiful tapestry for His glory and ultimately for our good. So yes, some in this world will be against us. I mean, just some people are, are just going to hate us, no matter how good we, we may treat them. But ultimately, they won't overcome us or the message we declare because God is for us. And They cannot stomp out the gospel. And no matter what things may look like now, he will right every wrong. He will bring about justice for his people on the last day. We will be vindicated. And Peter goes on to say in verse 14, he says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Sounds kind of like what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Because Peter is literally using... The exact same words that, Peter, that, 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 that Jesus used. This word blessed is the exact same word Jesus used multiple times in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. It describes not some mere earthly blessing, right? It rather describes one of divine favor. It's describing the very special accolade that God gives to those who suffer for doing good for His glory. 
It's a very special kind of blessed. You know, I think sometimes we just say, you know, we're blessed, and, and, and we are. But I, I think this is a very particular, specific type of blessing that God is talking about here. Now listen, if you are encountering suffering for righteousness sake, for doing good works, don't despair. If you're like, man, I'm living out this ministry that God's given me and I feel like nobody appreciates it. I feel like things never go right. I feel like people just criticize anything I ever try to do for them uh, because, you know, I'm trying to love them like Jesus does. Listen, don't despair. There is a blessing in the storm beyond anything this world can give us. It's a huge blessing. So treasure God's pleasure towards you. For it is greater than any earthly reward or praise of man. You can bank on that today. So put the hope of Jesus on display in your life. Do good no matter your circumstances. Do good no matter what the day may bring you. Be a good neighbor. Be a good employee. Be a good coworker, a good customer, a good friend, a good sibling, a good spouse. Strive to live a life that blesses others with kindness because it is such a drought of kindness today in our culture and our society and surprise people around you do simple acts of goodness that just that just blesses people that that shows them your love do things that make people ask why are you the way that you are why are you so different what makes you do the things that you do and when people ask that that gives you the open door to say, let me tell you about the hope that I have. Amen. Let me tell you about what Jesus has done for me. I don't just do this because I do it. I do this because Jesus has radically transformed me. Let me tell you about how he can transform you too. So do your absolute best to provoke questions from unbelievers. Live out a lifestyle of kindness, humility, a lifestyle that just oozes Jesus. I had a Bible professor in Bible college, and he would always say, hey, gentlemen, what happens when you squeeze a tube of toothpaste? <laughs> well, the answer is like, well, toothpaste comes out. He's like, all right, good. What should happen when somebody squeezes a Christian? Sometimes you might go, hm -hm, like the doughboy, I don't know. He's like, no, Jesus should just, should just ooze out of you, right? So we should be living that type of lifestyle. So we tell others about what Jesus has done for us and how he can do it for them too. So do good if you desire to put the hope of Jesus on display in your life. Number two, we honor Jesus. And if you look at verses 14, if we put the hope of Jesus on display in our lives, then we must honor him. We must honor him with what we do and, and get over our fear of the world around us. Get over our fear of what other people might think because we put Jesus first in everything that we do. Look at verse 14. Peter says, have no fear of them. No fear. This could also be translated more specifically, do not fear their threats. Don't fear anything that somebody threatens you with. And he says, nor be troubled. And this idea of being troubled, it's used elsewhere in the New Testament. It talks about anxiety, talks about grief, talks about doubt, just being unsettled, essentially inner turmoil. Do, Peter's saying, listen, don't be troubled. Don't have inner turmoil. Don't be anxious for what other people think about you because you follow Jesus. That's not our concern. So essentially, Peter, he is saying here, listen, even if you are being persecuted for doing good, don't fear your persecutor or any threat they bring against you. Don't be riddled with anxiety about them. Don't be unsettled by them. Do not fear man. Proverbs 29 and 25. You might know this one by heart. It tells us that the fear of man lays a snare. Do you guys know what a snare is? It's a simple and effective trap, usually made out of cord or wire, and it's got a little noose at the end, and usually a trapper will hide a snare amongst the brush, the bramble of a tight, narrow trail, so that small animals will, will kind of be, be funneled into them. And once the animal, animal enters the trap, usually and realizes what's happened, it, it, it panics and moves real quickly. And what happens? That noose tightens around its neck and eventually suffocates it, kills it, traps it, and kills it. 
And God's word says the fear of man is like a snare. So think about that. Think about that picture. The fear of man is like a snare. It traps us. It immobilizes us. It wraps itself around our spiritual necks, so to speak, and effectively smothers, suffocates, and kills our witness and testimony for Jesus. That's what being afraid of man will do to us. So listen, we must avoid this trap. This is something that we want to avoid. We cannot let the fear of man, we cannot let our worries, our paranoia about what people will think about our faith in Jesus, the repercussions we might receive from an employer or from friends, from a social circle. circle. We cannot let those things keep us from talking about the hope that we have in him and how others can have it too. We cannot be suffocated by that. So how do we do this? Okay, how, how do we do this? What does Peter say? Look at verse 15. He says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Peter's had a lot to say the last couple of chapters about honor, about reverence. And so the same is true here. In other words, honor Jesus, revere Him, stand in awe of Him, set Him apart as Lord, do these things in your heart, and and fear Him more than anyone or anything else. That's what you are to do. If you want to overcome the fear of man, then you look to Jesus. And Jesus had much to say about this himself. He told his disciples in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, from from the mouth of Jesus, he said, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So fear not, you are more of more value than many sparrows. So Jesus, God, knows everything about you. That's who we are supposed to fear. We fear the one who can cast into hell after he has killed the body. So listen, if you find yourself afraid of your unbelieving friends, your unbelieving family members, your coworkers, classmates, or just the culture in general, what they will think about you because you follow Jesus, what they think about him, what they think about his exclusivity claims, what they think about the biblical teachings that we follow, what they think about your faith in him, if you are wrapped up in anxiety with that, and you want to overcome that, and you want to gain courage today, then fear Jesus above man. That's what Peter tells us is the anti-venom to this fear that we have. So show him reverence. Show Jesus reverence in your heart. Be in awe of him. Set him apart as holy. Follow after him. This is the path forward out of that snare. This is how we overcome fear. One of my favorite things to do is read biographies and autobiographies of the saints who have came before us. I love reading about people throughout church history who have just done amazing things. And most of them, all of them, were regular people. I think sometimes we read the Bible or we hear about Lottie Moon or we hear about somebody like that, William Carey, Adoniram Judson, all these famous missionaries, and we think, man, they must have been superhuman. Like, you know, they, you know they, they must have been really special people. And in and, and some facts, yes, they were special, but they were just regular people, just like me and just like you. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of these people that I have read about before. He was a German pastor during World War II. And when everybody was fleeing Germany because they saw what was coming, they saw the storm brewing on the horizon. They saw that Hitler was coming to power. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, you know what, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay in Germany. And he did. And he spoke out against Hitler very openly. And he wrote about the evils of the Third Reich. And he organized protests and opposition against the Nazi party. And you can imagine what eventually happened to him. He was eventually imprisoned And just before the end of the war, just before the Reich fell, he was executed for his faith and his resistance to the hate and evil that the Nazis stood for. And then you ask yourself, what made that man so courageous? 
It was, it was definitely imminent death if he stayed and did these things. And it was simple. He feared God more than some of the most evil men who ever walked the face of the earth. And knowing his story, knowing what God used him to do, one of his most famous quotes gives me chills every time I read it. And I'm going to share it with you this morning. He famously said, Those who are afraid of men have no fear of God. And those who fear God have no more fear of men. And that was a man who lived out that statement. He stood in the face of the greatest evil that we can imagine in recent history, and he declared the gospel. So friends, listen, if we are going to put the hope of Jesus on display in our lives, we cannot fear the people and the culture around us. We can respect them, but we don't have to fear them. Instead, we must honor Jesus in our hearts, and we must know that he is our courage and that he is worth our witness to the culture around us. And as pastor and author Tony Morita, he put it this way. He said, it's the awe of Jesus that makes a witness for Jesus. So stand in awe of him today. Stand in awe of what he has done for you, what he did on the cross to forgive you of your sins, what he has done to bless you throughout your life, and then live with that hope that you have on display as a giant billboard for him in the culture around you. So honor Jesus. Do good. And then finally, number three, be prepared. And as I was typing out this point the other day, I couldn't help but think of the Lion King when scars like, be prepared. You know, does anybody else think about that? Maybe, okay, I got a few. Yeah, so I said be prepared, and Candace is like, yep. <laughs> so uh, we just happen to think like, you know, musicals about everything we do, I guess. So be prepared, verse 15 through 17. He says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So if we are going to effectively put the hope of Jesus on display, if we're going to be this billboard that we're talking about to the world around us, then we must be prepared daily, each day, to talk about him when the opportunities arise. Amen. All right, You have to be prepared for this or you will fumble. You will, you will definitely drop the ball. So notice two key words that Peter uses here in verse 15. Two key words that jump off the page. You can underline them, circle them. Always and anyone. Right? Those are pretty all-encompassing terms. Always and anyone. So in other words, every day, you and I should be ready to respond to every type of person. <laughs> every day. Right? So notice also that Peter says we are to be prepared to make a defense. Now what does this mean? This word defense, it's the Greek word apologia. It's where we get the, the term apologetics from. You might have seen that, the Apologetic Study Bible. You might have seen, as you're looking for Bible studies, maybe you're purchasing things through Lifeway, you know, things about apologetics. And, and that is where that word comes from. And some of you may hear that word and you might be thinking, what's that? So now I have to apologize for being a Christian? I have to apologize for, for, for my faith in Jesus? Like, I just say I'm sorry for following him? Others of you may hear the term apologetics and think, wait a second, I am no Bible scholar, man. I am not some big egghead PhD academia person. I don't have a seminary degree. I don't have a master's degree in biblical theology. I can't debate someone about creation, about science, or about linguistics or the historicity of the Bible. I can't do those things. Listen, don't go to either one of those extremes. That's not what Peter is talking about here. That's not what he has in mind when he's telling us this. He's not talking about apologizing for your faith in Jesus or formally debating someone in an academic setting. He's not talking about those things at all. We overlay those things onto the biblical text. He doesn't have any of that in mind. Instead, he has hope in mind. If you read what he's saying here, rather than a debate hall or a courtroom, Peter is talking about everyday conversations. You know the kind, the ones where you talk to a friend over a cup of coffee, in Ken's case, over a Coke, over the backyard fence with your neighbor. It could be a park bench with the other parents at the playground, with a fellow coworker on the job site, with another passenger on the metro, 
or on the streetcar, in the hospital room with a sick family member. These are the conversations, I think, that Peter has in mind. When he wrote this, he wasn't thinking about being in an academic setting and debating people. No, he's just talking about, these are everyday Christians he's writing to. People like me and you. And he's saying, listen, you got to be prepared every day to make a defense, to, to, to put together why you have this hope and tell it to other people. That's what Peter is driving at here in verse 15. Listen, we must be prepared to share Jesus and why Jesus is more precious than anything and why we have hope in this seemingly hopeless world. We have to be prepared to share these things. And how do we do this? Well, a few things. We can stay prayed up. <laughs> we just start every day with a prayer. Lord, help me. Help me to be a witness for you. Engage with the scriptures daily. Take a moment. Open that Bible app on your phone. Do a short devotion. Crack open your Bible at lunch break. Do something. Spend a few minutes in God's Word, and it will transform you. It will change you. You will begin to see a difference. Then hide that Word in your heart. Hang on to it. Do your best to memorize a scripture or two. Ask the Holy Spirit to make you sensitive to spiritual conversations. This is one thing that, um, that, that I tend to do. Like, I tend to really hear, if you, if you will just stop and listen, there are so many spiritual conversations going on around us every day. We might not normally pick up on it, but it's there. It's there, and God will give you opportunities to, to interject sometimes. And we trust the Holy Spirit to give us boldness and competency. Like, that's one thing we believe as Baptists, right? We believe in this big theological thing called soul competency. That's why we believe in the priesthood of all believers, that, that everybody can make an informed decision because we all have access to the same Holy Spirit. And so we can trust Him for boldness and competency when we need it. The kids are going through the book of Nehemiah this month. And one of my favorite things about Nehemiah is that he prayed. And in the moment when, 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 when the king gave him the opportunity to speak, he only had a second. He prayed one of those from the hip prayers, right? Just an under the breath, Lord help me, prayers. And he talked to the king, and God opened doors for him. And sometimes we have to do the same thing. We trust the Holy Spirit to make Jesus known. So we can stay prayed up, engage with the Scriptures, hide it in your heart, and then trust the Holy Spirit to help you do these things. So every Christian... Every Christian can do this because every Christian has the same hope in Jesus. You don't have to have a biblical doctorate to do this. You don't have to be some big, well-versed person in the Scriptures to do this. You need to know the basics, but you don't have to be an expert. But don't set out to argue or debate. That's the other ditch that sometimes this goes to here. Sometimes people are like, okay, I know my stuff, and I'm going to argue, and I'm going to debate, and I'm going to win that person over right now. And I think that we're more worried about winning the argument than the person. So we cannot argue and debate with people who are arrogant in their unbelief. We keep our attitude in check. Look at verse 15. Peter counsels us, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That word respect, again, is reverence. Same word. Peter repeats himself a lot. So friends, we must proclaim Christ and his gospel of grace with a Christ-like attitude. If we are going to declare a message of grace, then we need to show that that grace has impacted us and softened us so that we can offer it to others. We are to share this hope with gentleness and respect. We don't put the hope of Jesus on display abrasively, but gently. We don't declare this hope arrogantly, but respectfully and reverently. So remember Paul's words from Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Paul said this. He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. He's writing to the church there in Colossae. He says, listen, exercise wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So make sure that you're making the best use of the time. And when God gives you the opportunity to open your mouth, make sure that language is, is winsome and not abrasive. So listen, it should be our goal to win over people with the gospel, not with arguments, not winning arguments. That's not what we are to be doing. And look at who is writing this, by the way. 
Look, who, look who's writing this letter to us saying, hey, listen, don't be a loud mouth, don't be abrasive, be gentle. That's Peter. This is the same guy that cut somebody's ear off the night that Jesus was arrested. He was the one who was hot-tempered, salty demeanored, loud-mouthed. That's who Peter was. It's the same guy who had all of these problems, who put his foot in his mouth time and time again. But why the sudden change? What happened to him? What happened to Peter? The gospel happened to Peter. The gospel, the, the hope of Jesus, transformed him from the inside out. And he became a gentleman because of this hope. So that's what the gospel does, friends. It makes us warm. It makes us gentle. It makes us patient and approachable. It transforms us. And if these things are lacking in your life, you may need to check the dipstick in your heart and see why you're running low on Jesus. Because we must be warm, gentle, patient, approachable if we are to win others to Jesus. And Peter continues, verse 16, having a good conscience. And we can have a good, clean conscience because of what Jesus has done for us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live a life of righteousness even in the midst of suffering and persecution. I think Peter has hammered that point home for us over these first three chapters. And also through his power, we can have a good conscience knowing that we treat people with dignity and respect as we seek to put the hope of Jesus on display in our lives, as we seek to win others to faith in Jesus, if we treat them with, with, with honor and respect, we can have a clean conscience when we lay our heads down at night knowing that we have done our best to treat others the way Jesus would treat them. So why struggle to have this good conscience? Well, Peter tells us, the rest of verse 16, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Notice that he didn't say, if you are slandered, he said, when. Because he knew that persecution was coming. And he says, listen, you uh, can put them to shame. So listen, friends, your good behavior in Christ that he's talking about there eliminates any potential legitimacy to the false claims and slander of others. Essentially, you don't give people ammunition to shoot at you. You live a life that's above board, that is Christ-like. A life of gospel witness and good deeds is very hard to criticize. And people that do criticize it usually have another vendetta that they're chasing. So if someone does attempt to slander and mistreat you, they will be put to shame, not by you, but by the Lord himself. Let your, your life be your testimony. So hear this clearly. We are not called to shame or embarrass people when they attack us for being a Christian. That is not our job. Our job is to love them and point them to Jesus. So Scripture teaches us that on the last day, on that last hour when Jesus returns, when it's all over with but the shouting, when, when everything comes to a close, those who have rejected Christ will be put to shame. That's when that will happen. So it's not our place, it's His. And then verse 17, he says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So Peter makes another reference to the last day here. And to put it another way, it is better to suffer now for doing good than it is to suffer on the day of judgment for doing evil. It's better to suffer now for doing good and following Jesus. A strong warning that should comfort the follower of Jesus and terrify the unbeliever right? So listen, we are to put the hope of Jesus on display. We do good. We honor Jesus, and we stay prepared. So let me ask you, are you putting the hope of Jesus on display in your life? Are you being a billboard? <laughs> are you being that sign that points people to the hope that you have in Jesus? Are you pursuing a life of of faithfulness and making him known through your words and through your actions. Listen, some people that we encounter in this life and witness to will respond in faith to the gospel. They will get saved, and that is amazing when that happens. And it's so cool to be a part of that story with somebody that God is writing. But many others will not. A lot of people will just shrug it off. A lot of people won't even give you the time of day. 
you could very well face legitimate persecution one day for sharing your faith. But no matter the circumstances, our calling remains the same. We are to be faithful in putting the hope of Jesus on display in our lives, leaving the results up to the Lord. It's not our place. We, we don't have the power to transform a heart, to, to, to give somebody a heart of flesh and change it from a heart of stone. We don't have that power, but we can point them to the one who can do those things. We're to just be faithful, and we leave the results up to the Lord, and we pray that he will transform lives. So if we suffer, so be it. That's what Peter is saying. After all, that is the way of Jesus, is it not? I mean, are we acquainted with, with what happened to Jesus? I mean, he suffered for the sin of the world and was doing God's will. We are not above our master. Jesus said that himself. We do our best to follow him and his example. He did good deeds so that God would be glorified. He honored the Father unto death and had no fear of man, and he was prepared daily to gently declare the truth that we are great sinners and he is a great Savior. So if, if he did those things, and a couple of weeks ago we talked about how he is our example, why aren't we doing our best to fall in lockstep with the, the footsteps of the Savior? So let me ask you, do you know Jesus today? Are you even a Christian? If not, that can change today. If not, cry out to him and experience this living hope that we have in Jesus. I would love to tell you about that as much as I possibly can. Ken, Harry, any of us would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus and become a child of God. And if you are a Christian today and things are difficult for you and you're like, man, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to do these things. And you just need somebody to pray with you. We'll have a time of response here in a moment. We can, we can pray with you. We can do our best to encourage you as you seek to put the hope of Jesus on display in your life. So as we enter this time of worship, just ask God to, to deal with your heart. Ask him to encourage you, to equip you, and to sustain you in this calling that he has given you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for teaching us today from your word about what it means to put your hope on display. And God, we know that it's difficult. And God, I feel like we live in, a, in an age where things are just getting increasingly more difficult to live for you and to, to be a faithful witness for you. There's so many things that compete for our attention, that compete for our affections. And there's so many things that drown us out in this world. But God, we know that you are faithful and we know that you can do amazing things even through us, the most broken of people. So God, I pray today that we would just do our best to do good, to honor you, Jesus, and to be prepared to tell people about the hope that we have in you. So for my brothers and sisters today that are struggling, God, I pray that you would lift them up. I pray, God, that you would blow fresh wind into their sails. And I pray, God, that they would not give up the good fight. And God, for my friends who don't know you, God, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. I pray today they would hand their life over to you. I pray that they would recognize that you are calling them to you and that you can give them hope and peace and comfort, joy, forgiveness. God, I pray that they would see the hope that we have in Jesus. And I pray, God, that it would transform their lives. So God, move now as only you can. Help us to worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray these things.